you mind, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, you can be turning to the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to begin reading in verse 6, 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to begin reading verse 6. Uh, as you're turning there, I'd ask that you uh, uh, continue to remember the church outreach, that we would be burdened uh, with uh, the burden with just the souls of man. We need that. Uh, what I've found is when we get burdened, that's when we'll begin to do something. Uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, and we'll begin reading verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who have called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. I'd like to preach, the Lord be my helper this morning, on living in the victory despite the enemy. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your watch care. Lord, we thank you for, for your blessings on our church. Lord, we thank you and praise you for each and every one that sits before us this morning. Lord, we understand and know that you bought, brought them here by your own power, Lord, and we thank you and praise you for that. Lord, for the lost that are among us, Lord, that you might stir them up this day, that this might be the very day that you would speak life to them, Lord, that you would show them their lost and undone condition, Lord, that they might uh, cry out and for mercy and grace to you this morning. And Lord, we will be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, we read from uh, a section of the book of 1 Peter, the first letter that, uh, that Peter writes to the churches in general. Now, in many of Paul's writings, it was to a specific church and to a specific group, but Peter's are referred to as general epistles because they were shared. They went to more than one church. Now, similarly, we have to believe that if he wrote them and they went to more than one church, that more than one church had the same problem. If you'll, if you'll follow Paul's letters, he addressed specific problems at specific churches. Now, here we find Peter writing to a number of churches, and no doubt every one of them had the same problem. Now let me say first of all concerning the devil and Satan, we don't understand him as we should. We think, we think we've got it figured out and we don't. We think that, uh, that he always presents in an evil way, but he doesn't. We think that he is uh, this vile creature that we can pick up on easily, but he isn't. We do not understand the character of the devil enough. So as Peter is writing, he begins in verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Now every one of us this morning wants to claim the protection of God, do we not? We want to claim that He's going to take care of us when, when things get bad. We want to claim that He'll protect us to the end. Well, I'll give you two things. First of all, if you're lost, you don't have that protection. You, you, you can't take advantage of it. And secondly, I'll say this, that if you're out of the will of God, you don't have it either. Because what did it say? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Now, if we're not humbled and we're not under the hand of God, how could we claim the protection? You can't. Not be consistent. Uh, not, not with going with the truth in that passage. You can't claim it if you're not humble. Now, we live in a day and age where people are not humble. Mm -hmm. Do you know why people like a works-based salvation? 
because they get to be the big shot. They get to be the one in control. They get to do things according to their agenda, and there's nothing humble about it. If they do it, it's in their control. If they don't do it, it's in their control. And there's not, you know what, you know what uh, is, is the most difficult thing about grace is you can't pick it out. If he, if, he, if he implies grace, it's the mighty hand of God. And if he doesn't, there's nothing you can do about it. That, that's pretty humbling, is it not? Far from the contrast of saying, oh, you just uh, be baptized and everything's going to be right. The problem is this, there's no truth in it. None whatsoever. There, there's not a, not a crumble of truth in, in, in that system. So if we're going to have it, have a decent fight against the adversary, we've got to be humble. Now, in, in, in that, in being humble, you have to first of all admit your inability. And you know, that's pretty hard for, for Christians to do. That, that, that's in part for any, any of mankind. Well, was that not the, the, the very uh, uh, cornerstone of the original sin? They weren't humble enough to obey God. It, it takes humbleness to say, you know better than me, so we'll just do it your way. That, that, that is a very humbling thing to have to happen. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. Now, listen, He's not going to exalt you right now. He's not going to lift you up in any way presently. First of all, your flesh enjoys it too much. He's not going to lift, but He will in due time. Uh, when the time is necessary and when the time arrives, He will lift you up. He will give you great power in the day that you need it in due time. Not before. Uh, you can't demand in any sense anything from God. Did you ever think about that? We can go before Him and ask humbly, but you ain't going to demand it. Because God is too great for that. God is too powerful, and He's certainly not on your will when you decide you want to do something. And so we see that in due time, we will have that. Cast, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Oh, what a, what a wonderful blessing, and what a wonderful thing to think about, and what a difficult thing to put into motion. Oh, we rejoice in that verse, do we not? Casting all your cares upon Him. But the problem is, do we do it? Do we do it? Now, we can't claim the rest of it if we don't do the first part, can we not? Casting all your cares. Cares about money, cares about health, and this is the one people live out, cares about your soul. Mm -hmm. Do you ever hear somebody uh, say, well, if I go to hell, I'll go to hell trusting Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty good philosophy to live about, right? I used to think, well, that's an odd thing to say. Well, this is it. They, they think Christ is so sufficient and they're so insufficient. That's the only way they know to put it. You see what I'm saying? And so we see that we, we can't cast our cares upon Him and then take them back and expect the care of Christ. In other words, we can't uh, expect His provision and even, and even, and even suspect his, uh, uh, expect his sufficiency if we don't cast our cares upon Him. Have you cast your soul upon Him? I mean, really, this morning... Is He everything that you trust for salvation? If He's not, you have a real problem. If you're not, there's difficulty there. Then in verse 8, be sober. Be sober, be sober, be sober. You know what? Uh, most, I would say at least 50% or more of the so-called churches in Stewart County this morning, and, and I say so-called because, listen, it may be harsh and brass, but I do not believe that the Methodists are the true church. If I did, you know what I'd be? I'd be a Methodist. Right? And, and, but I'm just using that as an example. But many, many of them, all they have this morning is empty.
entertainment for their youngs. That's all they have. Children's church. Well, the problem of that is this. I never see the church divided in the, in the New Testament, do you? I don't. They all met in there together, did they not? And, and, and so we see in that that, that what, you, what you do is you don't get seriousness in that. What you, what you get in children's church is entertainment. What you get in children's church is a tickling of the flesh. In most churches, even the adult worship time, all it is is something to advocate the flesh. But he tells us to be serious. You know what? You better be serious about your soul this morning because it's the only possession you have. You better be serious about eternity because it's the only question you need to answer. You better be sober about it. You know what? When I think of time and eternity and standing before the mighty God, the great God Jehovah, and Him saying, Depart from me, you're, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. That causes my heart to tremble, and I hope it never stops causing my heart to tremble. You say, are you saying a works-based salvation? No, I'm saying this, that I still fear God. I still fear God. And so... When, we're not, when we come down here, we're not coming down here to have a party. We're not coming down here to have children's church. We're coming down here to be serious about the things of God and the seriousness of time and eternity. What, what, more, could, what more could we have? And so we have to see the flip side, since this is dealing with the attack of Satan, that if we're not, we're more open to him. Do we not? We're down here for a bonfire. That's all we're going to do. Are we being serious? Nothing wrong with that. If we're going to have a young time for the young people, that's fine. But don't think that don't think it's a replacement for the service of God because it's not. It, it, it's not a service in that sense. And so he says, be sober, be vigilant. Everybody knows what a vigil is? Here in the South, we didn't call it a vigil. We called it setting up with the dead. Y'all older than me heard that, right? Setting up with the dead. And where that comes from is being sure they don't wake up during the night. Did you know that? They weren't sure, sure that they were dead, so they would set up with the dead to make sure they didn't turn over in their sleep. That's the type of vigil he's talking about. So I, I have to assume this. We need some sleepless nights. Just tore up over the condition of our, of our children, the condition of our church, the condition of our nation. Just tore up. Set up a vigil. Another thing about a vigil is this. You need some light. If I told Brother Justin, you guard that door. Better be back there guarding the door. It's a vigil. So that says to me, Satan can slip in a lot of different ways. Both you as an individual and both of us as a corporate church, he can slip in in a lot of different ways. And remember, he's not going to present himself with horns and a pitchfork. He's much too wise for that. He's going to present in a way that we least expect. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, when it says the devil, it is always Satan. Uh, you find Mary Magdalene, whom seven devils were cast, or, uh, cast out of. You find uh, the maniac of Gadara, who was cast out 2,000 devils, maybe more. But I want you to see when it says the devil, it is speaking of Satan himself. Satan is a reality. Satan is the chief uh, fallen angel, and they're all under him. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, I want you to see this is a, an unusual passage. You've got to get the full effect of it. Who was Peter writing to? 
Churches. What is churches made up with? Saved folks, right? Was he wanting to devour the lost? He's got them. He wants to devour you. He wants to take every bit of wind out of your cells. And if he can compromise your Christian life and, and, and wind up your walk in a full measure of sin, he would love that. And the reason why that the world can say, see, I told you he'd never last. I told you it wasn't nothing to that Christian stuff. I See, I told you that he was, a, he was a charlatan. I told you he was a fake. That's what the devil wants. And the reason why he can compromise the gospel when, when he's got a lost person, he's got them. But when he takes a saved person down, he can compromise the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he wants. He wants people to think it's a falsehood. He wants people to think it's a fake. So uh, as Paul is writing to these churches, more than one, churches multiple, he says, listen, be vigilant because he's out there. And I want you to see there's a roaring lion. Now that kind of surprised me because you would think he would slip up on you. But he says he's going to come to you as a roaring lion. How many people have you heard preach? Men you heard preach when you thought, well, I've got to keep my eyes open because this one's going down. I mean, be honest, right? Kind of an even tone, very much unlike your pastor. Just, you know, and nothing wrong with them. Fine men of God, but just that, you know, even, just like you're talking in a, you know, in a Sunday school or in a, in, you know, just here we go. That's not the roaring lion. Now you think about the flip side of that. Now I know I can get loud sometimes. But what about these other movements? It's all about in, entertainment, is it not? Music and people whooping and hollering. Yeah. That's a roaring lion, is it not? I tell you what, if a roaring lion came in here this morning, it'd get your attention, would it not? I hope you got sense enough to run. Right? Right. And in the same way, this is how he would come on the bill of entertainment, somebody that will catch your attention and invoke everything that you have that there is about you. And says you walk up the bout seeking whom he may devour or consume, whom resist. Now that is a hard, hard thing to do. Go back to our example. First of all, if a literal lion came in here and he was roaring about, most of us wouldn't have the courage to address it. Let's be honest. Lions are scary to me. That's one of those things in the, in the zoo I'm, I'm marching by. They're the, you know what? In the, the, I mean, and they're the king of the animal kingdom. Is that not what they say? That, that, that they're in control. Now, similarly, this, this spiritual lion comes in here and he's roaring and he's bringing attention to himself and he's bringing the attention of the world upon himself and we're to resist that. How are you going to do it? If the lion came, if a literal lion came in here this morning, what are you going to do? You better have something to fight him with. Because the only thing he's worth, the only thing he can say about your arms and your legs is that they look real good to eat. How many of you's got a gun with you? Is that my only thing I can say to go against the line with? Right? So we proved the point, first of all, we're largely unarmed. Right? When the lion, and, and when the spiritual lion comes, all you've got is that book that's in your lap this morning, and you have to compare to what they say with that. And when they when it is inconsistent, you say, okay, I've got a lion in my hands. 
And then you know how to deal with it. But listen, if you don't know the truth of the Word of God, a line looks pretty good. And, and you have nothing to compare. You, you don't know enough about this to compare it out. So what are you going to do? Usually the lion will devour us. That is his goal. And we see that we must be prepared. We've got to be ready. Who resists? Now I want you to see this. It did not say rebuke. Those two, those two words are very, very different. They do not mean the same thing. So, listen, you're no match for the devil. You're not going to rebuke him. You know, uh, what does it say? When the Lord Jesus came walking out on the sea, He rebuked the winds and the waves and said, Cease, be still. And you know what? You don't have the power to do that. Neither do you have the power to rebuke the devil. But we have to take by this text that you do have the power to resist him. So how are you going to do that? How are you going to resist the devil when he comes your way? Because you're, if you're saved, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. So when he comes your way, what are you going to do to resist him? How will you be prepared with the, with the fallen angels? How will you be prepared to go against such force as you're talking about? Whom resists steadfast in the faith? The faith, the oracles handed down by, by God Himself through His men to us even today, resist Him with this book. You resist Him with everything you've got. And all you have is this. You know, as I was thumbing through my Bible, and uh, I, I was looking, and uh, all of you know, I usually make a little note of the date that, I, that, I'm, uh, that this passage has presented me. And I only do it when someone else is teaching and preaching. I don't make notes for myself in my Bible. I just And I was noticing one of the scriptures that, that Brother Junior uh, used this morning. I can't remember which one. I had six different men that had presented that before. And I've had this Bible for three and a half years, soon be four. And in that four years, I have had the same scriptures presented to me six different times in six different ways by six different men. You know what? I should know the application of that pretty good by now. Right? I should know where that it fits in. What about you? Now, unfortunately, conversely, this is the problem. Do you see any notes or any men's names? Did you say I'm prepared? Now through private study, I hope that I'm a little prepared. But do you see what I'm getting, getting at? We Sometimes we're not prepared enough because we've not studied enough. All we really have is what somebody else told us about. You be careful about that. We've got to be knowing what the faith is. Whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now, I want you to see, because a lot of people miss that end of that ninth verse. But they were accomplished in all the world. This, and notice it says the same. The same afflictions. You know what that, that says to me? Satan has a, little, a, a limited no, number of plans. He has a limited no, number of approaches. Because he says they're suffering from the same afflictions. They, they've gone through the same things. So if we can figure out how he's approaching us, certainly we should be able to resist, can we not? If we can figure out what his approach is going to be, we can resist what he's given us. So uh, this morning, if somebody was presented to you, the, all the saved make up the church. How will you resist that? Can you do that? 1 Corinthians 12, 12 verse 19, somewhere in there. I have placed some in the church. First apostles, then pastors, then teachers. Can you come up with that? 
That is resisting, is it not? When, when somebody comes your way and says it's this, you say, oh no, it's not that way, it's this way. Resist the devil. Push him back. Resist going in the way that he would like you to go. Verse 10, But the God of all grace, who have called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect or complete, establish, strengthen, settle you. Now I want you to see the first part of that that we don't like is after you've suffered. After you have suffered. After you have suffered. What did Paul say to his own, I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, now, I think it was Paul said to the church of Corinth, Ye have not suffered unto death. You know what? I'd have to say, what we suffer mostly is being approached by heretics saying, What about this. Right? So far in our nation, we've not suffered banishment. We've not suffered hunger. We have not suffered not being able to buy things because we won't take the mark of the beast. We've not suffered that yet. But uh, we may, should the Lord uh, not come back, His timing is perfect and complete. We, we, we may suffer some of that eventually, but we've not yet. And so, we must understand then and know that we do have to suffer a while. And the goal is to make it perfect, not sinless, but perfect, complete, Remember we said the way we were going to resist the devil is know what to approach him back with. That's being complete. How would you tell me this morning that the church was created and was always a, already a working body prior to Pentecost? Most of you can. What about verses that say you don't need the ladies to wear that pertaineth to a man besides Deuteronomy 5. Because you know what they're going to say? That's the Old Testament. Right? I can't tell you how many people. So we need to know what the, and there is New Testament scripture, you know that? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But you've got to know it, do you not? That's how you resist. Because if you don't resist, what happens is like, you know what? I don't really know that. Maybe it's not true. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't really know where to find in my Bible that it is all of grace. Maybe it's not. And that's where Satan begins to push you and to push you and to push you. Because you're not ready to resist. You're not ready to push back. You're not ready to say, Oh no, I know what the scriptures say and I'm comforting them. And so he says, After you've suffered a while, I'll make perfect, establish, strength, and settle you. This morning, you that are older and, and have, uh, have, uh, have some time of Bible study, are you settled? I'm settled. You know what? The Baptists have been called by different names down through the years. I'm not going to, I'm not going to defend that. There, there, well, there were the Moravians. There were the Paulicians. There was a great many different names down through the years. But you know what? I am convinced that Baptist people have the full effect of doctrine. Is it just a name? Yeah, I guess so. But I will say this. It was John the Baptist that did the, the baptizing on that day, not John Pentecostal. Right? John the Baptist. And so we see then, uh, we see then that we have to know and we have to be prepared. Verse 11, To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's what we should, that should be our desire, that we give Him glory and honor and praise through ever. Now go with me back to the Gospel of Matthew, if you will. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, and we're going to begin reading in 
uh, verse 21. Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to shew unto his disciples how they must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now, I want you to see this was not a holly jolly paint plan. I'm going down to Jerusalem. They're going to deny who I am. They're going to beat me mercilessly. I'm going to bleed out. And then finally they're going to nail me to the cross. They're going to raise it up. And I'm going to die. That's the plan. Does that sound like a big hoorah? Certainly it doesn't. You know what the plan of our government for us right now is to snuff us out. You say, oh, you're being paranoid. Oh, no, I'm telling you the truth. Does that sound like a, a barrel of monkeys to you? It's not fun, but it is true. Now, when, when we hear something like this, uh, it kind of generates fear in us. It kind of generates a uh, problem in us. It kind of generates all kinds of emotion. Verse 22, Peter the same way. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> that were an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things of God, but those that be of men. Now, did you get the full effect of that? Do you believe Peter was saved? I do. Matthew chapter 16. But whom did ye say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, a man that understood, a man that had been convinced. And now the Lord Jesus Christ himself saying, get behind me, Satan. You know what that says to me? That I could be used the same way. Sure. I could be the hindrance. I could be the problem. So, number one, James' epistle tells us to watch out for false doctrine. And then, here we find the Lord Jesus says, watch out. Now, I don't want y'all to come in here doing like this. But I do know this, that I can be, I can be mistaken. I could quit showing the love of Christ. I could get more upset about what people are saying than what God is saying to me. All those things can happen to me. Could they not you? And so we see then that, that a saved individual can be influenced by Satan. I do not believe that they can be possessed of Satan because the Bible says you are sealed unto the, the, the day of redemption. But I do think that we can be influenced by him. And the way that we keep from that is to, is to be aware when he comes on the scene. Now that's a very difficult thing. Going me way back to the book of Genesis, the initial sin... Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, if God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now I want you to see particularly that word subtle. Or subtle. Some people pronounce it. Same word, subtle. Now, if I come in and I say, well, you know what, church, I've decided that we was wrong the whole time, and I think that we're just going to go the Pentecostal way. Is that subtle? No. But if I just came in and just said, you know, I've been studying some things, and, and I'm going to present them to you, and it looks like that maybe the church really wasn't around until Pentecost. That's so. That is saying, you know what they all else say too? Let's study this together. 
Let's reason together whether these things be so. It's not subtle, ain't it? That's, that's the operation of the devil. So when we begin to be on guard for him, when, when, we, when we, want to, we want to be able to rebuke the enemy, when we want to be able to see that, that the enemy is coming and we've got to be able to resist him, know first of all that he is very subtle in the things that he does. He, he never does anything in an obvious way. Uh, First Chronicles chapter 21, um, we find David. The Bible uh, characters David as a man after God's own heart. First uh, Chronicles 21, and Satan, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, Satan is alive and well and doing his job way before 19, uh, what, what is it they say, 1914 or something? That's what a certain group will tell you. But we see that out here, long before the days of Christ, that Satan attacks David. He attacks Israel. And you know where David lived? He lived in Israel. He lived on this earth. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that the devil was already here, right? And so it says that Satan stood up against Israel. Now I want you to see he was taking, he was standing up against national Israel. The land of Israel. The country of Israel. And how did he attack them? One person. One individual. Was he later? Yeah. And, and Definitely that Satan is wise enough to do that. But you know what? He could easily have done it. I'll say this. He could have still done it. Through the minus minute person <coughs> in Israel. What would be easiest for Satan to attack New Testament church? Would it not be me? But he could easily attack it through you. And what he does is this. He puts an unsettled feeling in your heart. He, he, he puts a feeling where you lack satisfaction. He puts a feeling where you're not getting anything in the preaching anymore. And then he comes up and says... And then Donna or Sister Daisy or whoever goes to her husband and says, you know what? I don't think Larry really knows what he's teaching anymore. Maybe we should go over here to church. They have more people anyway. That's how it happens. That's what he does. And he is a master at it. Another way that he gets in, he begins to do things Making you not like other people. You know what? We're all individuals and you better remember it. Don't let Satan plant that seed of discord. And David said to Job, I mean to Joab. Now do you see how this grows? He's going to impact Israel and much of Israel would die for this. But what did David do first? He told one person. Did, did he get up and say, okay, now this is what we're going to do? No, he did one person, and he did a, a person in authority. You know what? A lot of people won't say this today, but I believe, uh, I believe that there are men that just have leadership abilities. And if you possess them, you be careful. That is, you know what Joab was? He was the chief captain. You know what he could do? He could lead God's army. And you know who? <laughs> the second thing that uh, Satan had David to do was go tell the military leader. Be careful. It's a blessing, but be careful with that, with that gift. And so we see next that he, he provokes people. He gets them to do something. Uh, in the book of Psalms, and this will be our last reading uh, this morning. In Psalms chapter... Uh, 109. Psalms 109. 
excuse me, and we're going to begin reading in verse 2. The Bible says, For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceit, deceitful are, are the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. Now, if you'll read this, it's a psalm of David. He had been betrayed again. I don't know which betrayal of this was, if it was Absalom's rebellion or, or something else, but I do want you to see this. He says, The mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the, de of the deceitful are opened against me. They, I want you to see that sometimes the devil will make a frontal attack. He likes to be subtle, he likes to be deceitful, but sometimes he'll make a frontal attack and whomever he uses to make it will make you feel so angry you could bite off their head. That's a frontal attack. And you know what? It could be your bedmate. It could be the lady next door. It could be someone that you simply do not like. That's a frontal attack. And you know what? As we near the end of this thing, I see more frontal attacks than I used to. And you know why? The devil's getting a little antsy. He's getting a little upset. Because he knows what's coming. And so, he's got some churches to tear down. He's got some churches to tear apart. And so he's getting a little bit antsy. And so he's just right in your face. And, and listen, I, I'm just the kind of man, it's not a good thing. And my wife paid me a good compliment yesterday. She said, you're not as bad as you used to be. And, but if somebody gets in my face, I'll probably get in their face right back. That's just the kind of man I am. And it's not a necessarily a good thing. But we all have that bend in us. Instead of turning the other cheek, as the Lord Jesus Christ in His own ministry uh, tell, told us to do, we're right back in their face. You know what? We need to let that mess go, and we need to speak the things that are peaceable of Christ. Uh, verse 3, And they cast me about also with words of hatred, and fought against me without a cause. For my love they are my adversaries, but I have given myself unto prayer. So your biggest fight, your be in the fight, your biggest weapon is going to be prayer. Now what about your prayer life? And I'm the world's worst. Donna rebuked me the other day. She says I was worse on Facebook. I don't know if she said teenager or what she said, but she made implications that I spent too much time on Facebook. And you know what? I would have to say she's right. Because you can't pray well when you spend the bulk majority of your time on Facebook. Right? And so we see, we see then that uh, what David did in response to this all-sided attack, he makes the point that it came from every direction, that what his thing to do was to pray. And they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him and let state Satan stand at his right hand. Now I want you to see that, that Paul's solution, I mean David's solution and his idea was you put Satan over there at his right hand. And you say, well, somebody that was mean enough to rebel against David, that's what he deserves. Well, you be very careful because you will read in the book that Joshua also stood and Satan stood beside him to rebuke him. Joshua was a saved man. Joshua was used greatly of the Lord and Satan standing right beside him. And you know what, <coughs> what, uh, what Joshua's response was? The Lord rebuked he, he, he didn't rebuke him, did he resist him? You betcha. But he did not rebuke him. So I ask you this morning, what's your, what's your ability in resisting the devil? Are you good at it? I, well, I did pretty well. Could you be better? Sure. Yeah. Every one of us.
resisting the devil. And the best way to do it is to see him win. Mm -hmm.